They got across the water. It's been some time. They're doing okay. They pass by a town. When they passed by a town, those people were not Muslim. They had their own religion. And they had temples and they had big statues and you know, uh, uh, monuments and stuff. And they saw people praying in front of them, begging to them, bowing to them, putting, making a nice temple around, all that. They saw that stuff. And they had seen some of those things in Canaan because they're Canaanites. And they had seen some of those things in Egypt. And they saw those things again. And after everything Musa alayhi salam did for them, you know what they said to Musa alayhi salam? Ij'al lana ilah kama lahum aliha. Could, could, could you make us a god like these people? Like they have such a, they have such nice colorful gods. Can we have one? Now, listen, like, if you put yourself in Musa alayhi salam's shoes for a moment, after everything he's done for them, after fleeing Egypt, coming back, standing up to the Pharaoh, 10 years of struggle against the Pharaoh, nine years or more of struggle against the Pharaoh, crossing the water with them, and, they cross, and they've seen so many miracles of Allah, after everything we've been through, you turn around to your prophet, and what do you say? Hey, this, you know, I think if we had a statue, it, it would help me concentrate a lot more. It's like a visual aid, you know? Like if we had like a God statue, then it, I think these people look like they're doing pretty good spiritually. Look at them, they sit there for hours. They have so much better khushur than us. I pray for two seconds and my mind goes towards is it pakore or samosa today? I can't remember. My mind goes all over the place. You know, it's for Muslims, khushur is very hard, isn't it? Staying focused in your prayer is not easy. But then you look at other religions and those people are just sitting there and they're sitting in front of the statue or they're sitting on top of a mountain and they're sitting for six hours and they don't budge. How they get that kind of khushur? That's because shaitan's like, oh, you're already doing my job. I don't need to distract you. <laughs> He's interested in you, bro. He doesn't want you to have concentration with Allah. If they, don't, if they have concentration on anything else, he goes, I don't even have to work on these people. They're already doing my work. I can put my full concentration on ruining the guy who's making salah. Right? We have nothing to be jealous of from it. But these people came and said, well, maybe, maybe we could have that. Now, the, the real question before we go on, the real question is, why would they say that? Why would they ask that? After seeing all those miracles and following a prophet, why would they even ask that? And these aren't just pagans. These are children of Ibrahim alayhi salam. And they've had prophets for so many generations. Ishaq, Yaqub, you know, there's prophets of old that they, they know that legacy. And Musa alayhi salam is part of that legacy. So it's not like the Israelites converted to Islam because of Musa alayhi salam. They were already Muslim. Then how come this happened? And this is why I want to, this is where I want to remind you that the stories in the Quran, they're not just stories about ancient people. Allah told us every one of those stories because it will be applicable to Muslims today and every generation. Allah will never tell us a story in the Quran because it's interesting information, because it's fun facts from history. Nope. It's always some living problem that will come back again like a virus that will come back again and again and again in every generation. It's not like something that existed a long time ago. So I need you to know, know something about the Israelites today. These people went through many different cultures, like, like Canaan. And in Canaan, people used to consider the bull, the bull is the strongest animal on the farm. Because compared to the sheep or the cow or anything else, the bull is the strong animal and it pulls all the weight, does all the work, right? So the bull became a symbol of strength and over time in Canaanite religions and Sumerian variations, the bull became an object of worship. They used to worship the bull. In fact, they even used to look at the moon when the moon is weaker and it, it, they, they, they looked at it and said it's the horns of a bull and the bull is pulling the sky. That's what they believed about the stars or about the, about the moon in the sky, right? And from it then became the sacredness of the cow. And that, that wasn't so much in Egypt, but it did exist among the, the people of Canaan. And the Israelites had a lot of genetic you know, mixing with the people of Canaan. They, sp they spent many, t think of it this way, Muslims living alongside Hindus for hundreds and hundreds of years, for example, right? Or Muslims living alongside Buddhists for hundreds and hundreds of years. 
I'll tell you an interesting thing that I saw in Indonesia. In Indonesia, many Buddhists live there, yeah? And Hindus also. So Muslims, when Islam came there, they noticed that when they call people to the temple, they have, you ever seen those giant, like, dongs, and they go, Doom. you know those, like, those martial arts movies that you don't watch because you're Islamic? Dong, right? They do that. So they would, they would strike it, and they'd strike it again, and strike it again, and strike it faster, 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 faster. Dong, 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 dong. And that's their way of saying it's time for, you know, it's temple time or whatever. And the Muslims were so smart to call people to Allah. You know what? One of the things they did, because they people that never heard the adhan before, so you know what they did? They started doing the dong, 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 and then they do the adhan. And hundreds of thousands of people started coming to the masjid because they heard the, the thing. And I went to the masjid in Indonesia and I heard the, the thing go off and I was like, am I in the right house of worship? What's going on? No, no, no. This is a tradition from before and it commemorates something that brought millions of people to Islam. The most populated Muslim country in the world. <laughs> Subhanallah. But I wanted to give you this example because what happens when different religions live side by side. You take something and you take something and there's some exchange happening. Like in South Asia, many of us are from Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, etc. Right? The way that the girl is dressed for the wedding and the colors that she wears or the way that they dress the, the bride and the groom, that's not Muslim tradition. Where did that come from? That's Hinduism. That comes from Hindu tradition. We have many values and many tr parts of our tradition that are actually borrowed from Hindu culture. So we know that some borrowing happens. Now, borrowing in masala is okay. Borrowing in uh, outfits is okay, no problem. You understand? Borrowing in architecture, no problem. Where do we not borrow? In our religion. In our religion, we don't borrow. Our religion is already pure. It, Allah has given us guidance already. And Allah told the Israelites, I have taken a promise from you from the side of the mountain. Hold on to this. Don't let this go. And then they go to Musa and they say, could you get us a God like that? I mean, there should be some room for ijtihad, you know. We're still Muslim. We're still Muslim. So we do a little bit of this stuff. And guess what happened in countries like Muslim countries that are that are closely related or in proximity to other religions, Muslims started developing their versions of Hindu shrines. Their versions of alternative houses of worship that are not masajid. Their versions of worship that look just like Hindu worship, just like Buddhist worship. It looks just like it, but they're, they're still Muslim. And they say, it's not a big deal. I mean, they have that. We, we can have a little bit of that here and there. And those of you that are from Pakistan, India, you already know what I'm talking about. You already know what I'm talking about. So many rituals, so much paganism made its way into Islam. And the thing is, Allah is teaching us something really powerful. That human beings will always be drawn towards shirk and they have to go through a lot of training. A lot of training to let go of that desire. In fact, even if they are living with a prophet, which prophet are we talking about? Musa alayhi salam. They live with a prophet. They saw the prophet's miracles with their own eyes. But the culture has affected them for so many hundreds of years that even though they're living with a prophet, they have the audacity to ask that prophet, what's so bad about some extra, you know, can you make us a visual God? How's that a, how's that a bad thing? SubhanAllah, it's crazy. I hope you guys enjoyed that video clip. My team and I have been working tirelessly to try to create as many resources for Muslims to give them first steps in understanding the Qur'an all the way to the point where they can have a deep, profound understanding of the Qur'an. We are students of the Qur'an ourselves and we want you to be students of the Qur'an alongside us. Join us for this journey on BayinaTV.com where thousands of hours of work have already been put in and don't be intimidated, it's step by step by step so you can make learning the Qur'an a part of your lifestyle. There's lots of stuff available on YouTube but it's all over the place. If you want an organized approach to studying the Qur'an beginning to end for yourself, your kids, your family and even among peers, that would be the way to go. Sign up for BayinaTV.com.